good morning to you. It's 9.30, we're ready to start this morning. It's good to be back with you. I was traveling last week, and I appreciate Chris stepping in and, and covering while I was gone. Uh, but today we're going to jump back into uh, our study of Paul. I think I, I left my clicker down here just a second. All right, now I can, I can continue. You can see on the, the, the slide, our, our topic this morning is talking about Paul in prison, and we're going to talk about his letter to Philemon, his shortest, shortest letter. Uh, probably doesn't get the attention that I think it deserves, uh, but we can cover the whole thing in just part of our class tonight, or this morning. Uh, last time we were... Uh, studying. Uh, we got through the end of Acts. Uh, Paul appe appealed his case to Caesar, uh, which got him transferred to the capital Rome. Uh, and while he's waiting, the book of Acts just ends, uh, which is kind of a strange place to leave off. We don't, don't get the verdict for his trial. Uh, so either Luke uh, knows what the verdict is and decided that was not a good ending to the story, uh, or he just, that happened to be the current time when he was writing, uh, was before the verdict, uh, but whatever it is, he, he didn't tell us what happens next. Uh, so that, you know, we, we basically finished the book of Acts then, uh, but we still have quite a bit of, of material to go through, uh, because we still have several of Paul's letters. Uh, so far, we've done six letters of Paul. Remember, we're going through these in the order they were written. Uh, the order they're in your Bible is by length. So they put the biggest letters, the longest letters first, and go down until they get shorter and shorter. Uh, but if you actually look through these letters uh, in the order they were written, so the first letter written was Galatians. Uh, it appears to be written after Paul's first journey, where he travels through Galatia, uh, but before the, the church in Jerusalem makes a decision about what to do with Gentile Christians. Uh, so that's Acts 15, before the second journey. Uh, I think it had to be, Galatians had to be before that, or else he would just would have said, well, the elders have decided this issue. You don't need my case for it. Just do what they said. Uh, so I think he's writing before the Jerusalem Council and before the second journey then. The next two letters are his letters to the, the church in uh, Thessalonica, uh, so that these are from Paul, Silas, and Timothy. And you remember on the second journey, it's Paul, Silas, and Timothy traveling. Uh, and this is when they first go to Greece, and, and, Mass and Thessalonica is a city of Greece. So uh, a little bit later on that second journey, Paul writes these letters back to that church. Uh, and then we have these, the, the big three, First and Second Corinthians and Romans, uh, that appear to be written during the third journey. Uh, the third journey, remember, is... Paul talking about fundraising, trying to make this collection to bring back to Jerusalem. All three of these letters mention that fundraising effort. Uh, so uh, he uh, appears to have written these on the third journey. So that's six letters down. That leaves us with seven more letters, not counting Hebrews. And maybe we need a, a special class on if Paul wrote the letter to the Hebrews. Uh, I don't think he did, so I didn't include it on this list, but maybe we'll, we'll talk about it. Uh, so these seven are commonly grouped into two, two groupings. Uh, the prison letters, which would be Philippians, Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon. And the other three are, are commonly called pastoral letters. That's First and Second Timothy and Titus. Now, the reason they're called pastoral letters is because people say, well, this is Paul, the older, experienced pastor, writing to these young, uh, inexperienced pastors, Timothy and Titus, giving some advice to them. Well, you and I know uh, that that's not the language that Paul actually uses. Uh, he doesn't ever talk about Timothy and Titus being pastors. Uh, you and I already know this, so I don't have to uh, belabor it too much. But the word pastor means shepherd. And when Paul talks about uh, shepherds, 
uh, he's talking to elders. Uh, you can see that when he talks to the Ephesian elders and calls them shepherds or pastors. Uh, he doesn't talk about Timothy and Titus being pastors. So, so I, I put the pastoral in, in quotes there. Uh, it still actually works as a name for us, I think, uh, because it's in these letters, 1 Timothy and Titus, that Paul does give the qualifications for elders or pastors. Uh, so we, let's, we'll go ahead and stick with that. Uh, and we'll, we'll keep calling this group the pastoral letters. Uh, they have the, the qualifications for shepherds listed in them. You know, there's other ways you could divide these out. You could put Philemon is a letter to an individual. Uh, so in, in our Bibles, uh, typically, or I guess always, it gets grouped with uh, Timothy and Titus as letters to individuals versus letters to churches. Uh, but, uh, you know, it depends. Second Timothy, it appears he's in prison, but we don't count it as a prison letter. Uh, but we'll, we'll, let's just go with this for a bit. So uh, we're going to talk about these prison letters. Uh, the question then is, when, in, when was Paul in prison that he wrote these letters? Well, the, the issue is Paul was in prison quite a bit. Uh, and you ask, well, let's, let's let, look through this. When, when was Paul in prison? Well, we have this, this night uh, he spends in prison with Silas uh, in Philippi. Uh, when they have the earthquake, uh, the next morning they uh, convert the Philippian jailer. Uh, one night's probably not enough time to write any of these letters. I don't think uh, that's the time. And then, then, you know, this whole section at the end of Acts, he's going from prison to prison to prison. Uh, so he starts off in Jerusalem, not you know, really another short time here, just a couple days uh, where he's in Roman custody uh, in the city of Jerusalem. But they transfer him from Jerusalem to the city of Caesarea, and he spends two years in Caesarea. Uh, and you know, we don't know what sort of things he was doing during those two years. Uh, after two years, this is when he makes his appeal to Caesar, uh, and he travels to Rome, a little sidetrack along the way with the shipwreck, uh, and he spends two years in Rome. Uh, and here it appears he has a little bit more freedom uh, that he's able to speak uh, and meet with people. This is more like a house arrest in Rome. And that, that's where we get to the end of the book of Acts. Uh, so we've got you know, four plus years in prison uh, where he could be writing. But we have other times too, not, not mentioned in, in the book of Acts, when, when Paul is writing the letter, the Second Corinthians, uh, he's comparing himself to some other uh, Jewish Christians and comparing his credentials to theirs. Uh, and he says, I have been in prison more frequently than they have. Uh, well, at this point, uh, this is before the end of Acts, this is the only recorded time we have is that night in Philippi. Uh, and so, I mean, it's technically true to say, if you've been in prison one night, you've probably been in prison more frequently than, than me and most of us here. Uh, but that's not really how you would uh, expect someone to say that. Uh, it sounds like, at this point, that he's writing Second Corinthians, uh, he's been in prison multiple times that Luke has not told us about in the book of Acts. Uh, and in Romans, written about the same time, a little later, uh, he says, greet Andronicus and Junia, remember the uh, apostles, uh, my fellow Jews who have been in prison with me. Now, once again, in the book of Acts, we don't have any reference to being in prison with Andronicus and Junia. Uh, so it appears beyond the, the, the times we have mentioned in Acts, there, there have been other imprisonments uh, that Luke has not, doesn't know about or decided not to tell us about. Uh, and it, so there's potentially other times where Paul could have written these letters from prison. Well, let's, let's you know, turn to the letters themselves, and let's see if we can uh, hunt around for any clues about when they were written. So we'll, we'll go through these seven letters that we have left. Let's start with Philippians. Uh, you know, he says, I'm in chains for Christ. So he's, he's definitely in prison. Uh, but it, this first reference was, it's become clear throughout the whole palace guard. Uh, so this is the, the praetorium, uh, sort of the, the Roman special forces. Uh, that would be possibly Rome, uh, possibly in, in another 
sort of regional capital, uh, but at least hints at Rome. He, he writes to them that I'm confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. So we notice here, even though he's in prison, his expectation is that he is going to be released and able to, to travel again uh, after this imprisonment. Uh, all God's people here send your greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. Well, Caesar's household, I, I mean, he's got family maybe everywhere, but that sounds to me like uh, most likely Rome. Uh, so if we, from the imprisonments, imprisonments we know about, uh, we get some hints here that maybe he's writing from Rome. Ephesians, we don't get any uh, clear information, except that it's clear he's a prisoner, he's in chains, uh, but doesn't give us, I don't think, any, any specifics beyond that about where he's in prison. Uh, for Colossians, uh, first notice, my fellow prisoner Aristarchus. Now, Aristarchus pops up a couple places in the, the narrative of Acts. Uh, the first time is in Ephesus, uh, where the, the riot gets going, uh, over uh, people leaving idolatry, uh, and the, the idol makers are upset about that. Well, two of the guys, they grab two of the guys, and one of them is Aristarchus, who gets grabbed by the mob in Ephesus. Uh, so that's one place he's mentioned. Uh, the other place is he travels with Paul to Jerusalem to deliver the collection, uh, and he travels with Paul and Luke from Caesarea to Rome. Uh, he's on that same ship that gets shipwrecked. Now, it could be that he and Paul both got arrested at that time, uh, and he is being sent as a prisoner to Rome along with Paul. I mean, that would fit here. If Paul is in Rome, he's talking about his fellow prisoner, that he and Aristarchus both got uh, seized at the temple and are both being sent to Rome on this ship. Uh, now, now, at the time he's writing, they're, they're both in prison there together. Uh, so it's possible that it would be Rome here as well. Uh, he mentions that he has friends with him. Uh, Luke is with him, and this guy Demas. Just, just remember this name, Demas, that when Paul is writing Colossians, uh, his friend Demas is with him. Okay. Philemon. Okay, Philemon, he says he's a prisoner, he's in chains, uh, he has a fellow prisoner, a Paph Paphras, uh, and notice here uh, the, the greetings again, Mark, Aristarchus, we've had him before, Demas again, and Luke. Okay, so he's got all these guys with him, uh, including Luke, Aristarchus, and Demas. And, and as we saw in Philippians, where he, he's hoping to visit Philippi soon, uh, he tells Philemon, uh, prepare a guest room for me because I hope to be restored to you. Uh, so once again, it, it appears that he is hopeful uh, that he is going to be released, uh, that he is going to be acquitted of his charges. Uh, so, moving on to, to 1 Timothy. Uh, 1 Timothy, he says, I urged you when I went to Macedonia. What, now we can see Paul is, does not appear to be a prisoner when he's writing 1 Timothy. Uh, that he appears to be moving freely again, uh, that he has gone to Macedonia and he's telling uh, Timothy to go to Ephesus. Uh, so it doesn't, we don't get any other hints of him being in prison when he writes 1 Timothy. Uh, and when he writes Titus, it's the same thing. Uh, he says, I left you in Crete. Sounds like they were both in Crete at the same time, and Paul moves on and Titus stays in Crete. So once again, does not appear to be in prison, uh, he appears to be moving freely. He says, he tells Titus, come to, to Nicopolis uh, because I've decided to spend the winter there. So this is a city in Greece. Uh, so once again, appears to be uh, moving uh, freely throughout the region. But then we get to 2 Timothy, and now it's back to chains, uh, back to being a prisoner. Uh, let's read through this first quote. May the Lord show mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, because he often refreshed me and wasn't ashamed of my chains. On the contrary, when he was in Rome, he searched hard for me until he found me. Okay, so we, we do, sounds like here, uh, 2 Timothy is in Rome. Uh, but 
But why did Onesiphorus have trouble finding Paul in Rome? Why did he have to search so hard? Uh, can you just ask the Christians in Rome? Could you ask Luke or Mark or Demas? Uh, haven't, you know, they, they would know where he is, and he's able to, to meet with people. Uh, so that's a little odd. He's chained like a criminal. Uh, he writes, The time for my departure is near. I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. Now compare this to how he talked in Philippians, where he says, I hope to come visit you soon. I wrote to Philemon that says, I, I'm going to come visit you when I get out. Uh, this doesn't sound like a guy who is expecting to be released from prison anymore. Uh, this is, sounds like someone who is expecting that they're going to, to die in prison. And Demas, remember Demas, who had been with Paul when he was writing these other prison letters? Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you. So Mark's not with him. Demas, not only not with him, he seems to have uh, fallen away from the faith, uh, but Luke is with him. He also tells Timothy, when you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas and my scrolls, especially the parchments. Now here, we've got this a little puzzle for us, is why did Paul leave this stuff in Troas? Uh, we, we don't, this doesn't line up with any of the, the travels we have in Acts. Uh, if he had these, these valuable things, uh, what was he doing leaving them behind? Did he have to leave in a hurry? Uh, did he... Did he have to leave not of his own free will, as in he got, gets arrested in Troas? He's not able to, to take this stuff with him. Uh, so, interesting statement here. Uh, and we get this, this hint again that people have left him, uh, that no one came to my support. Okay, well, let's, let's summarize this all together. So, clearly, when Paul is writing Philippians, Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon, he's in prison. Okay, he mentions it in every letter. Uh, it seems throughout this time that he is hopeful of being released. Uh, and it seems that he has many friends with him, uh, including this guy, Demas, uh, who uh, is uh, on good terms with him. Then we get to 1 Timothy and Titus. It, it appears that now Paul is moving freely. He's no longer in prison. Uh, but then we go to 2 Timothy, and he's back in prison. Uh, and of these friends that have been with him, only Luke is still there. Demas has left, uh, and now he's not hopeful of being released. Now he expects to die. Okay, well, let's, let's see if we can kind of come up with a, a timeline for what's going on. Here's, here's my suggestion for it, uh, which you are free to, to accept or to revise. I think while Paul was under house arrest in Rome, he writes these first four prison letters. So this would be the two years from 60 to 62. Uh, and that's you know, all the way up to the end of the, the book of Acts. After two years, he's acquitted. Uh, and then he, he's able to resume his travels. Uh, he travels to Greece, uh, to Turkey. Uh, he's going to Nicopolis and, and Crete. Uh, and it's during this time that he writes 1 Timothy and Titus. While he's uh, released from prison, traveling freely. Uh, but then, uh, at some point, he travels back to Rome. Uh, maybe he's still got this idea that he wants to visit Spain uh, that he talked about uh, before he got you know, sidetracked with this four-year imprisonment. Uh, maybe he's in Troas and gets arrested, and they transport him to Rome. Uh, and so that's why he needs his, his scrolls and parchment. Whatever it is, this would be around the time, if he'd been free for a couple years, that uh, there's this fire that devastates the city of Rome. It's 64 AD. Uh, this is, uh, you may be familiar with this, this is the, uh, the time of Emperor Nero, uh, where this fire you know, rushes through the city of Rome. Uh, huge portions of the city are destroyed. Uh, people start blaming Nero, saying, what were you doing uh, while the city was burning. Uh, and he says, oh, it wasn't me, it was them, the Christians. Uh, and the Christians who lived on this, the poorer side of town actually didn't have uh, quite so many uh, 
so much destruction as the richer parts of town. Uh, and so the, it becomes this, this uh, theory that you know, it's the Christians who started this fire uh, because they didn't, none of their houses got burned down. Uh, and it, it, it's this outbreak of persecution against Christians uh, during the reign of Nero following this fire of 64. Well, lots of Christians are arrested and killed at this time. And it could be that, that Paul, being in Rome, uh, gets caught up in this as well. Uh, he gets arrested uh, just you know, for being a prominent Christian. Uh, and it's while he's in prison this time uh, that he writes 2 Timothy. Now, maybe, remember, Onesiphorus you know, couldn't find Paul in prison. Well, it would make more sense during this time where you know, Christians are, are much more careful about uh, how they're meeting, uh, who knows uh, uh, that they are Christian. Uh, so it, it would make more sense at this time that uh, Onesiphorus had a harder time finding Paul in prison. Uh, and then perhaps uh, Paul is executed shortly after this, in maybe 64, 65 A.D. Uh, that, that's what uh, the, the church history would say, is that uh, Paul was beheaded in Rome uh, during the reign of Nero. Uh, but obviously that's not anything in Scripture about that. Uh, we do have an early church historian, Eusebius, uh, who does basically support my view. Uh, he's writing around the year 300 A.D., uh, and he's, he's using the book of Acts, but he's uh, using it as other sources as well. And here, here's how he describes uh, the end of, of Paul's life. And he says, Festus was sent by Nero to be Felix's successor. Uh, it was under Festus that Paul made his defense and was sent bound to Rome. Okay, we read this in Acts. Uh, Luke, who wrote the Acts of the Apostles, brought his history to a close at this point. He said that Paul spent two whole years at Rome as a prisoner at large and preached the word of God without restraint. After he'd made his defense, it said that Paul went out again on his preaching ministry. When he came back to Rome a second time, he suffered martyrdom. In this imprisonment, he wrote his second Timothy, in which he mentions his first defense and his impending death. Now, Eusebius points to this passage in 2 Timothy, uh, to support this view, uh, he says, you notice how he says in the past, past tense, I was delivered from the lion's mouth. Uh, so Paul's talking about this first imprisonment where he was released, uh, delivered from danger. Uh, but he doesn't have any kind of future tense about I will be delivered from the lion. Uh, his future tense is I will be brought to the heavenly kingdom. Uh, so his expectation for the future, for this second imprisonment, is uh, that he is going to, to end his earthly life. Uh, so he, he finishes, we can add all this up to, to show that Paul's martyrdom did not take place at the time of that Roman imprisonment that Luke records, the end of Acts. At that time, Nero wasn't as cruel, and Paul's defense of his doctrine was more easily received. Later, when Nero had advanced to commit lawless deeds of daring, he made the apostles as well as others the subjects of his attacks. Uh, so even at this, this first trial at the end of Acts, it would have been Nero who was the Caesar that, that Paul appealed to. Uh, and you know, perhaps at this time he's not, not as concerned with Christianity, uh, not until after uh, the fire and Christianity starts getting more attention does he really start persecuting uh, the Christians in Rome. So that's uh, my theory, is there are two Roman imprisonments that Luke ends during the first Roman imprisonment, uh, and it's during that one that he writes Philippians, Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon. He's released, he travels again, writes 1 Timothy and Titus, and then he's imprisoned a second time, and that's when he writes 2 Timothy and that's when I think uh, his life ends. I'll say that there's a second theory uh, that's also very popular amongst scholars, uh, besides the, the Roman imprisonment. Uh, this is the Ephesian imprisonment theory. And here's the, the basic arguments that Paul writes these letters uh, while he's in prison in Ephesus. 
Well, first point, we, we already mentioned this as well. Uh, Paul was in prison more often than we know about in Acts. Uh, so, you know, we, we don't have to just stick to, to Caesarea and Rome as the places we know about. I think we, we, we talked about this when we, we did 2 Corinthians. Uh, something really bad happens to Paul in Ephesus, uh, and, and Luke doesn't mention this at all uh, when he writes the book of Acts. Uh, so this is 2 Corinthians 1. We don't want you to be uninformed about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Uh, so at this point where Paul is at this dark moment where he's ready to give up on life, maybe he was in prison. Uh, and Luke you know, didn't mention anything about any sort of problems at this point. Uh, another point they, they make is, so it seems weird if Paul is in prison in Ephesus that he writes a letter to the Ephesian church. Uh, that it's not only the letter from Ephesus, it's also the letter to Ephesus. Uh, and so they point out, actually, if you look at Ephesians 1.1, where it says it was written in, or to the people in Ephesus, uh, NIV there has a footnote that says some early manuscripts don't have the word in Ephesus. Ephesus. And so that in the, the body of the letter itself, in these manuscripts, it doesn't say anything about where it was written to. So the, the theory would go something like this, uh, is that Paul is writing from Ephesus, and uh, people know it, it, this is something to do with Ephesus. Uh, maybe the church in Ephesus has this copy. Uh, they associate it with Ephesus, and some later scribe puts in the words, in Ephesus, to clarify uh, where this is written. But he's actually uh, mistaken. It's written from Ephesus, not to Ephesus. Uh, so I don't know, I, I'm not sure about that one, but that's a point for the, the Ephesian imprisonment. Uh, the final things are going to get us into a, to Philemon. Uh, and we'll have to, we'll have to start thinking about the book of Philemon to, to understand these questions better. To say, where would Paul be if he planned on visiting Philemon? Uh, this is where he says, you know, prepare a guest room for me. Uh, where would a slave from Colossae run away to? And where would Paul send Onesimus back from? Now, here we, we, we need to pause. We need to start digging in to the book of Philemon. I think maybe we actually need to, to look at this on a map. So the, the book of Philemon is written to this guy who lives in the city of Colossae, named Philemon. He's a, a wealthy Christian. He hosts uh, a church in his home, uh, and he is a slave owner, uh, which seems maybe surprising to, to our modern senses that uh, you could be this Christian leader and a slave owner. Uh, and maybe we'd like Paul to, to speak out against that more strongly uh, but there's this Christian slave owner in Colossae named Philemon, and he has a slave who runs away, it appears. Uh, perhaps this slave first steals some money, uh, which you know, aids his passage, uh, and uh, he escapes, but at some point he runs into Paul when Paul is in prison. Uh, and this slave ends up becoming a Christian. His name is Onesimus. Uh, Paul happens to know Philemon. In fact, he, he actually is the one who, who converted Philemon to become a Christian. Uh, and so he's got this slave of Philemon's, uh, and he sends Onesimus back to Philemon with a letter uh, explaining uh, a request for Philemon. Uh, so the, the question is, you know, Paul is in prison uh, and Philemon is in Colossae. Where would a runaway slave from Colossae go? Well, the nearest big town is Ephesus. You know, it's 100 miles away or something, uh, just by foot. Uh, so the, the, the proponents of the Ephesian imprisonment theory say, well, 
you know, we, we have this idea of travel today that, you know, we, we travel all over the place. Uh, but back in this time, people, most people really don't travel. Uh, you don't really leave your hometown. Uh, you, you're born there, you live there, you die there. And traveling is, an, uh, is a rarity. Paul is an exception uh, in the first century. Uh, could this runaway slave really have gotten all the way to Rome? And then Paul sends him back from Rome all the way to Colossae. Uh, and Paul himself is planning on to travel from Rome all the way back to Colossae. Uh, wouldn't it make more sense if it was nice and close here in Ephesus? Uh, so that, that's the argument for it. Uh, I, I, I think, when you think about, we don't have runaway slaves, but if you had like a, a runaway teenager or something from Greenwood, uh, where would a, a runaway teenager from Greenwood go? Well, the, the, the logical places would be either like the next big town, you know, coming into Fort Smith, or, you know, the, you know a really big town, uh, I don't know, New York City. Um, you could see the, the argument for either way. Uh, either you get out of town and go to the next big town or to the biggest town where no one is ever going to find you uh, unless you somehow cross paths with Paul. Uh, so I, I see the argument for both here. I don't, I don't think that's uh, necessarily uh, persuasive. So uh, those would be the two theories. I, I, tell you, I, I'm, I think Paul is writing from Rome, uh, but lots of people think he's writing from Ephesus. Uh, some problems with the Ephesian theory. Uh, like I said, New Testament never talks about Paul being in prison in Ephesus. Uh, so we're, we're kind of speculating on that point. I said maybe, maybe the capital is a logical place for a runaway slave. Uh, and as, as we saw in Philippians, there's these hints about being in Rome. Uh, when he talks about the royal palace and Caesar's household, uh, those things I think are more likely in Rome. Okay, well, let's, let's dig in a little bit more to the book of Philemon, maybe uh, a book we haven't studied very often. Let, it's just, it's short, we can read through it, I think. Uh, so starting in verse 1 of Philemon, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, also to Athia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So Aphia here is probably Philemon's wife. Archippus is probably his son. Uh, that's why he, he just greets the entire family here at the beginning. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. So it's a great way, if you have a request to make of someone, uh, to start with uh, some, some nice things to say about this, this guy you're writing to. So he, he does have uh, some, some positive things to say to Philemon. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, Yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It's none other than Paul, an old man and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, that I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. Now the word Onesimus is another word that means useful. Uh, so he's uh, perhaps doing a little wordplay here with this useless and useful language. Uh, I'm sending him, Onesimus, who is my very heart, back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so he could take your place in helping me while I'm in chains for the gospel. But I didn't want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you do would not seem forced but would be voluntary. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. So here we get what Paul has uh, 
uh, we see what he's finally working up to ask, is I, I would like you to take back this slave, this slave who has stolen from you, who has run away, and take him back no longer as a slave, but as a member of your family, as your Christian brother. Now, this is uh, a pretty radical request uh, in this time. Uh, and if you're looking for, for Paul to, to speak out against slavery, here is, is Paul making a, a radical uh, request that just completely defies the, the cultural norms of the time. That this, this slave who has treated you wrongly, who deserves to be punished, maybe imprisoned or killed, I want you to not only take him back, I want you to give him his freedom. Not only give him his freedom, I want you to welcome him into your family. Uh, it's an amazing thing. If you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I'll pay it back, not to mention that you owe me your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than what I ask. And one more thing, prepare a guest room for me because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings. So do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Okay. Did you catch some of this persuasive language that Paul is using uh, writing to Philemon? This is uh, you know, how you might write uh, to someone you're close to, that you, you know you can... Uh, have this kind of influence on. He said, you know, I, I could uh, tell you that this is what God wants you to do. Uh, I could just go ahead and tell you that, but I'm not going to tell you that. I'm just going to ask you uh, to, to do what I'm requesting here. Uh, even though I could say you should do this uh, as a follower of Jesus. Uh, he says, you know, if, uh, you know, if he's taking anything, I'll pay it back. Uh, but just remember, uh, you owe me your life. Uh, that uh, it's because of me, probably, that you became a Christian. Uh, so I'll pay back what he owes, but just remember, you owe me too. Uh, so that's a little uh, bit of influence there. Uh, I'm, I'm confident that you're going to do this. I, I'm confident you're going to do even more than, than what I'm asking here. So it's some just great uh, persuasive language that, that Paul is using here uh, to let uh, Philemon make this decision. Let's think about a couple of questions for us as we, as we wrap up this book of Philemon. Well, what's the value of Philemon? Uh, this is maybe Paul's, I think Paul's only letter where he doesn't really talk about the gospel. He doesn't talk about uh, Jesus has died and raised from the dead. Uh, you know, it's, it's Paul that gives us all this great language about the atonement of Jesus, about redemption and reconciliation, uh, that he's uh, purchased us with his blood, that he has uh, paid our debts, that he's ransomed us. So we get all this rich language from Paul, uh, and he always talks about the, the death and resurrection of Jesus. And here, he mentions Jesus, but doesn't talk anything about uh, that. So how does this, this personal letter uh, make it into our New Testament? Well, I want you to notice something. Uh, even though Paul doesn't talk about the, the atoning work of Jesus, uh, what he's really talking about here is, I, I'm wanting Philemon and Onesimus to be reconciled. Uh, and I know Onesimus does not deserve to be brought back into relationship with you, Philemon, uh, but I'm going to take that on myself. Uh, whatever he's done, uh, just treat that as uh, my own uh, debt. I'm going to pay his debt so that you two can be reconciled. And so I, 
even though we, we don't have, talking about Jesus and redemption, uh, we have this acted out uh, as Christ followers uh, that, that Philemon and Paul and Onesimus are, are uh, following Jesus by doing exactly what Jesus did, by reconciling relationships, by forgiving these debts, uh, and w- even without mentioning uh, the death and resurrection of Jesus, we still have this displayed in this letter. Uh, so it, it's a very gospel-centered letter, I think. Last question for us. Does Paul get what he's asking for? Well, you think about this a second. You say, well, we don't know. Uh, we, we don't have any uh, evidence about how Philemon uh, responded to this. Uh, you know, who knows? But I actually think we do know uh, that Paul did get what he was asking for here. And I think the reason is simple, is that we still have this letter preserved in our New Testament. And I think if Philemon got this letter and said, this is the stupidest thing Paul has ever said, and rips it up and throws it in the trash, obviously it's not going to make it into our scripture. Uh, But Philemon gets this letter, uh, and somehow from, from Philemon's hands, it makes it to the church, uh, and it makes it into Scripture. And I don't think that happens if Philemon thinks Paul's off his rocker here. Uh, You can almost imagine that this this church that's meeting in in Philemon's house, uh, that Paul, you know, or Philemon stands up and says, I I got this letter from Paul I want to read you today uh, for our worship. Uh, And as he reads this request from Paul, he he, he then says, you know what, I, I want you to know right now, uh, I'm going to do this, and uh, to show the, the reconciliation that we have in Jesus, I'm here to announce that, that Onesimus is no longer my slave, that now he is my brother. Uh, I, I don't think this letter gets preserved unless Philemon did what Paul asked. Uh, so I do think this is a story that we can, we can know has a happy ending, uh, and that Philemon uh, is released, uh, and that, or sorry, Onesimus is released from slavery, uh, and that we have this example uh, for the early church uh, in this world of slavery, uh, that that's not how Christians act, uh, that Christians don't have to, to own other people, uh, that in Christ there is no slave or free, uh, as Paul would write uh, to the church in Colossae, where Philemon was. Uh, so I think uh, we, we, we can be sure, be fairly confident, that uh, this gets the response that Paul wants. Well, next week, uh, we've got three more prison letters, Ephesians, Colossians, and, Phil- and Philippians. Uh, they're all kind of connected to each other, so what we'll uh, go through those together. Uh, especially Ephesians and Colossians, lots of of similar uh, themes in those two books. Uh, So we'll we'll tackle those next week. Uh, Then we still have 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus, and maybe another week of kind of wrapping up the life of Paul. Let's close this morning uh, with this prayer uh, from the book of Philemon, uh, from Philemon chapter, or Philemon verse 6. We don't have chapters of Philemon, just one chapter. Uh, where Paul is uh, hoping that that Philemon gets a a deeper understanding of the gospel. And what better way to to get a deeper understanding than by acting out uh, your obedience to Christ. Let's read this, and and then we'll, we'll be done for today. I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. Amen. Thank you for your attention. We'll continue next week, uh, and I'll see you then.